Well, good morning, everyone. How's everyone today? Good. Everybody good? Yep. Ah, good. That's good to hear. Uh, first, let me start with just thank you um, for all the cards and messages and prayers during my, the recent eviction of my appendix. Uh, that was kind of a fun little strange turn of events recently in my life. But, uh, you know, some, I had a few people send me an email, actually, which is kind of convicting, where they said, Brent, you know, if you want some time off, you don't have to have surgery to get that. And I'm like, well... Thank you for that. No, we were able to still take a week off, which was good. Recovery's great. Everything looks good, but uh, it's great to be a part of a family that knows you're being prayed for and cared for, and uh, thanks for all those messages and everything. You know, we're still in this series. We're calling today special, uh, and we've spent several weeks on this topic. Now, here's the question to start with. Is anybody surprised at just how much time Jesus spent around food? I mean, I I just think that makes Jesus even more relatable. That's my people right there. You know, if you like food, I like food. And just so you know, we're only halfway done. Like we still have like five more messages after today that are still centered around food that Jesus is going to be interacting. I mean, like you, you really begin to go, wow, Jesus loved some food and that's great. But we've, what this continues to show us is the importance of food and, and relationship and how Jesus came to do what, what he did. And I think for us, what's an incredible reminder is, yeah, we have our little continental breakfast out there, which is great, you know. I mean, it's wonderful. I know I hear the bemoaning of, let's bring the donuts back, but this is just so much easier. Um, but, you know, even with what we do on Sunday, this is really limited when we think about the relationship and the conversation and the things we can actually do when we sit down together with other people around food and drink and not to be rushed, not to just, you know, eat and move on to the next thing, but to actually enjoy it, to be together. I may have mentioned previously, you know, recently Carrie and I got the opportunity to go to Germany and it was so convicting. We'd go to these restaurants and we, as great Americans, we would walk in, we would eat and we would leave. And I would notice like all these tables were here before we got here. And they're still here as we're walking out. What is it that they're doing, that they're seeing, that they're experiencing, that we're missing? And I think Jesus is kind of showing us this. So we're going to jump into another dinner party today where Jesus is at a party and, you know, there's a ton of people around. And, and so it had me thinking, though, if you were to throw a dinner party, if you could invite anyone you wanted, not Jesus, because we know Jesus is the standard church answer. You cannot say Jesus. We're going to assume he's at the top of everybody's list. Who would you invite? Who would be at the top of your list for a dinner party? It's a challenging question, right? Who do you like to spend the most time with? My wife. Your wife. Who's good? Oh, man. Hey, hey, right here. Right here. Right here. That's in the story today, too, by the way. Good answer. Very good answer. Who else? Who else would you invite? It could be anybody. Just remember, it's going to be very telling who you invite, right? I mean, it's like friends. Okay, I heard friends. That's a good one. What was that? Church family. Okay, I like that one. Great, great, great grandparents. Okay, why would that one? Just because you don't know them and. What the pictures you've seen? Yeah, 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 the pictures you've seen. It's an interesting question, though, right? Like, who would you invite if you're, if you're throwing a dinner party? And honestly, I, I feel convicted because I think, isn't that the mode some of us should be in any way? Hospitality, opening our homes, enjoying being around the table. This should be a pretty easy question for us. But a lot of times I think we go, oh, I don't know. There's so much pressure to know who I would or wouldn't invite. And it is a bit of a trick question because... As we go into the story today, we're going to find that Jesus is at the home of another Pharisee. And as he talks to the people, he talks about who gets the invites to the party. He talks about the appropriate behavior there, including where you get to sit uh, and those kind of things. And speaking of seating, I'm disappointed in every one of you this morning because as you walked in, who noticed what the sign said at the door? Luke says he did. What did it say? Wait, who waited to be seated? None of you, you are all in trouble. Liz, they did not follow your directions on the sign. So we're going to have to do better next week. No, 
That's the, that's the title today, Way to Be Seated. So let's take a look. We've got a decently long passage today. We're going to cover a lot of territory. And what's crazy is Jesus does this at one dinner party. It's like, wow, Jesus, calm down. It's too much to take in at one time. So all centered around Jesus in this meal together. We're going to start in Luke chapter 14. So let's d- jump right in. It says, one Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Some translations say dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisee and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked him, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on a Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. A few things going on here that we need to already pay attention to. Notice, once again, Jesus is in the home of a prominent Pharisee. Now, this is not the first time we've seen this, but Jesus continues to do this. Now, did you notice what's going on there in the beginning? It says that he was being carefully watched. And so what we see is that there's already this dynamic taking place between Jesus and the religious leaders because Jesus is teaching some things they don't care for, and these people are really beginning to set him up. They're really trying to catch him and to get things that they can pin on him to take him out. And Jesus is not stupid. Jesus knows this, and yet he continues to put himself in this position. He continues to open himself up to say yes to an invitation to a dinner with the enemy with those who see him as the enemy. And I'll tell you, this one is challenging for me because Jesus is continuing to go to these places and I'd love to just ignore this and gloss over it, but there's something I think that we need to be paying attention to because we don't see it once, we've seen it multiple times. If we say we follow Jesus, if we say our desire is to live as Jesus lived, then what does his behavior by continuing to go to the home of people who basically consider him an enemy, what does that teach us? What does that show us? It's convicting, right? I'm not the only one that sees that. Because even as I was talking with some people this week, you know, it's easy for us to, very, to fall into that us versus them mentality. You know, well, I want to invite people who look like me and think like me and talk like me and believe like me because that just makes for a much easier dinner party, doesn't it? And yet, once again, we find Jesus moving beyond the us versus them mentality that seems to permeate our culture today. And he finds the time to eat with those who hold very different ideological, theological, and even political different views They're different than him, and yet he's willing to sit at the table. And as I said, what is amazing about this is that this is most likely a setup. This is most likely a trap that they have laid for him. Because did you notice, it says they're watching him. They're keeping their eyes on him. Because, you know, one one translation says it says it actually means to watch lurkingly. Well, that's creepy, isn't it? I mean, good grief, that's worse. That's terrible. There just happens to be a man with an illness there, you know, that needs to be healed. And this condition was often associated with God's judgment, either because of the person's sin or their uncleanliness. And if you've paid attention at all to Jesus, we know that Jesus is often moved with compassion in these moments. When he encounters these people, it's not like he's just like, well, you get what you deserve. He leans in, he moves, and he's moved with compassion, and, he's, and, he, and he acts on it. And then there's the catch. Because this meal is on the Sabbath. And there's all these rules and these regulations. You know, even the fact that they're having a meal on the Sabbath, you know what it tells us? That all the preparation for this meal was done the day before. Because you can't cook on the Sabbath. And so the setup here is that will Jesus heal somebody that could be considered as work? Now, just so you know, this isn't Jesus' first rodeo on the Sabbath. This is not the first time that he's been confronted on the Sabbath with something to do. This is the fourth time. If you read through Luke, you'll see that this is a recurring theme for him. But they've laid this trap, and they're setting him up, and they're looking, and they're saying, okay, what is Jesus going to do? Well, there's no surprise, is there? Jesus does what Jesus does. And he does it 
Before he does it, I love this. He asks a question. And did you catch their response? How'd they respond? Did you see that? Nothing. Just crickets. Silence by the people. You know, they're just, they have nothing to say. Jesus says, hey, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Quiet. That's telling, isn't it? We don't want to say yes, because then we're giving him permission to do it. And we don't want to say no, because then we look uncompassionate. So let's just be silent, because that's easier. What's interesting here is that there really was no specific law forbidding healing on the Sabbath. I didn't realize that until I'd studied that. It was actually a rabbinic interpretation of Scripture that was the source that became the rule that said you can't heal on the Sabbath. So what they'd done is they'd taken the general practice, the principle of the Ten Commandments, you shall remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. That's what God said. And they looked at that, and in their religious eyes, they said, well, let's add, let's interpret what that means. And so they began to add some things to it, including no healing on the Sabbath. Now, God didn't say that, but they added that. But I love that when Jesus asked this question, he just silences the crowd. And I can almost picture Jesus in this moment as he asked that question, kind of going, well, okay, you're healed. Or I could even kind of picture a little frustration, maybe an eye roll here, you know, when he asked the question, oh, good grief, guys, we're going to go through this again. Now, we don't have evidence that Jesus did either. But what he did do was he healed the guy when he knew these people were setting him up, when he knew that they were going to watch him, when he knew that these people were willing to pounce, just waiting to pounce on him for doing it. But he does it anyway. And he heals the man and he sends him on his way. And then he asks another question to speak to what has just happened. And then he asks the question because it's, it's, he brings that question to them at this point because then he says, wouldn't you do this? If your kid fell in a well on the Sabbath, you're going to get the kid out of the well, right? It's a pretty basic question, in my opinion. Pretty you know, obvious answer there. Any parents would say, no, let your child sit there till Monday. <laughs> if so, when uh, oh, I, I see a partial hand over here, I'm a little concerned, <laughs> a little concerned. <laughs> it's, authentic. it's authentic. I love that answer. But you know, even, even what should be an obvious answer where everybody's like, yeah, Jesus, you know, Jesus, you're right. You're right, Jesus. We would do that. Nothing. These folks are just so religious and so tied up and bound by their own rules and interpretations of everything that they've got. They just refuse to answer. What do we see here? What do we see in Jesus? What we see is what we always see is incredible compassion. But this Sabbath stuff that he continues to do, to do he continues to show us time and time again that compassion is even greater than creed. It's even greater than dogma. It's even greater sometimes than theology. Because compassion, love, overrides those things. That's a little convicting. Let's just end there and see what, you know, that's enough for us to deal with today, right? Hang on. Jesus is not done at this dinner party. He's got a lot more to say. So, same dinner party, and Jesus is just kind of sitting back noticing some interesting things going on. He's healed this guy, and he's watching, and he begins to see how people are seating themselves at the table. And so, he addresses it. Look again at Luke 14. We're going to pick up in verse 7. He says, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let's understand a little bit of the history here. When we talk about a dinner table, we're not talking about the way we see it today. We're not talking about a circle with chairs around it. We're not talking about a square or a rectangle with chairs all the way around it. Let me show you a picture. Here's a picture of how this could have been laid out. 
This is uh, a triclinium, I think is what it's called. And uh, here's, here, here's what I learned about this. At banquets, this, this basic item of furniture was the couch for three, uh, three of them, the triclinium, and uh, they were arranged in a U-shape. And there's basically a low table and a high table and, and all this good stuff. Now, guests reclined on their left elbows. I'm going to tell you what, this looks like the most <laughs> uncomfortable way to have a meal. If this is your dinner setup, I really don't want to come. I mean, I'd rather sit on the ground. This, is, this looks awful to me. But anyway, so you're leaning, you're reclining on your left elbow. Uh, the place of highest honor was the central position on the couch at the base of the U. So I've got an arrow pointing to what would have been the position of honor. The second and third places were those on the left of the principal person reclining behind him and on the right, reclining with their head on his bosom. And we see that reflected in like the Last Supper. We, we have that. Uh, after this, there seems to have been ranked the couch to the left with the places on the first couch and then the right and so on. So this, isn't that an interesting way to arrange and see? I'm not sure who thought this was a great way to eat, but okay. But Jesus sees at this what we see, I think, every day. People jockeying for position. Because who wants to sit at the low couch? That's the far one over there. Who wants to be at that position? That's terrible, right? I mean, that's like the low place. And I mean, I'm better than that. I, I, yeah, I know I'm better than that. So I'm going to pick my seat. You know, I, I think I need to be right next to the person of honor because, I mean, it's me after all. And that's kind of how we view things. Now, we don't say those things out loud because it's inappropriate. But we often think those things. And I will tell you, I don't know that we're completely to blame for this. After all, how many of you have ever gone on a job interview? Anybody? What do they tell you to do at a job interview? Sell yourself, right? Look out for number one. Nobody's going to sell you better than you do. And so after all, when we do these things, it seems like we elevate pride. It's a good thing. And you have to publicly proclaim who you are, how great you are, your accomplishments, so that the world will understand just how much respect and, and, and notoriety you actually deserve. I mean, we've all heard the, the interview joke before where they'll say things like, oh, well, tell me your weaknesses. And, you know, and it's like, well, I have to tell you, I just I work too hard. Um, I care too much, and I love too deeply. You know, those are my weaknesses. Yeah, whatever. Sounds better than I'm a disorganized, scatterbrain who bucks authority. He's only going to give you about 60%. I mean, really. I mean, that's probably truer. But Jesus puts this in perspective, and this isn't the first time Jesus says this. Jesus repeatedly makes this same statement over and over and over again in his teachings about what it's like to be a part of the kingdom. He says, you know, look, it's better to, be, to sit down, think less of yourself, and allow somebody to ask you to move up than it is to be asked to move down. Now, for us, when, if we were to think about this, we would probably blow it off as a joke, shrug it off, and be like, <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 I didn't mean to sit at this seat. I was just kidding, you know. But in this culture, this is a, a highly honor and shame culture. A demotion like this would be highly devastating. I mean, for them, honor and shame were key issues of a person's identity, their worth, their character. It was a big deal. In fact, as I was studying this week, there's a rabbi, Akava, who lived around the 110 time frame. And it's actually, he made these same statements that Jesus did. He said to, his, he said to people, he said, let me instruct you, take a seat two or three places lower than you're even entitled to. Because it's better that people say, come up, than to say, go down. But again, as Jesus says this, what, what we need to understand is that Jesus isn't saying, so what I want you to do is feign humility. What I want you to do is just pretend, be strategic in this. Now, what Jesus is saying is that actually let this be who you are. Let this be of the position that says, you know what? I may deserve a seat of honor, but I'm not going to take a seat of honor because I'm going to humble myself and allow others to be elevated, for others to be set up above me. 
We have to move beyond, as people of the kingdom, we have to move beyond the idea that we have to elbow and push and shove our way to the front as if we have something to prove. If we live that way, what that shows is that we really don't understand who we are and whose we are and what God has to say about us. Because if God says you're his child and you're his, then everything else is garbage. Doesn't matter where you sit. I can sit at the lowest seat knowing who I am in God and I knowing I don't have anything to prove. But we live in a world that says I have to jockey for position. I need to elevate myself even if it means putting others down in the process because I'm right, I deserve this. And Jesus tells us, be prepared. Those are the things that will get you humbled. I don't think that means God's sitting there going, I got you. I just think it means just like this, there's going to be somewhere, sometime that somebody comes along and reminds us we're not all that in the bag of chips. Just how it is. We need to be aware. So Jesus continues this dinner party and he says, all right, I'm going to show you compassion and I'm going to teach you about humility. But he's not done. He keeps going and he tells one more parable that continues to challenge conventional wisdom. And let's pick up Luke 14 in verse 12. He says this, he says, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they can't repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. What does Jesus have in mind? Because this is how parties worked in his day. This is kind of how relationships often kind of work if we're not careful. We set them up as reciprocal relationships, don't we? You do for me what I can do for you. And that's just kind of how the world works. But what Jesus is talking about is, again, it's a level of compassion and action. It's grace and generosity. In doing so, he's laying out for us our own spiritual reality. I mean, just think about what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, do things for people that they can't repay you. It's not so we get the upper hand. It's not so we kind of hold the cards and be like, oh, you owe me. But where else do you see this in your life? Our relationship with God. Isn't that how our relationship with God is defined? Where God has done something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves, and he really doesn't expect repayment. He sent his son, Jesus, to die for us. He rescued us. He brought us salvation. He showed to us this incredible grace and generosity. And I love the bit of humor that Jesus drops in here where he says, you know what, if you invite them, they may invite you back. As an introvert, I understand that. I don't want the invitation back, right? I'm like, I'm good staying home. It's all right. You'll be obligated to attend. But Jesus calls them and us to show generosity to those who can't repay. And it should be more than doing things. Okay, this we're not going to like this. It should be more than only doing things that keep those people at arm's length. Do you see how Jesus described them? It's not, a, it's not a who's who list of people, rah, rah, right? I mean, it's like the poor, mm. the crippled, yeah. the lame, ooh. the blind. Not on the top of anybody's dinner party list, are they? And remember the significance of a meal. Jesus isn't just saying, do something for them. He's saying, invite them to the table. Okay, hold on, Jesus. That may be a line too far for us. Because by inviting them to the meal, you're encouraging relationship. As one author I read this week put it, it says, sometimes we cloak our superiority in compassion, but superiority cloaked in compassion is patronizing. And sometimes just writing a check is how we keep the poor, the undesirables at a, different, at a distance. But we're called to sit at the table with them. That's what Jesus is saying. 
Let's go back two steps. The compassion one's easy, right? The humility one, we get that. This one is challenging. This is the one. This is the one that gets really hard to sit at the table with the less than desirable people. Have you had enough yet? Jesus isn't done. (laughs) You'd think he would be, right? He keeps going in Luke 14. Tells one more story. Listen to this. It says, When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. You know what that is right there? Brown nosing. Somebody trying to brown nose Jesus. But Jesus doesn't have it, and he keeps going. He says, Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. And another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleyways of the town and bring in, uh uh-oh, who's he bringing in? The poor the crippled, the blind, the lame. When Jesus repeats himself this closely together, please pay attention to it. He's trying to get a point across. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited to my, uh, who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Wow. Wow. We could spend an entire message just on this one part, but let's just jump to the end here. First, what I want you to see is there's a priority problem. What's interesting here is that it wasn't like this dinner was just invited in that moment. They'd already gotten a save the date. That had already gone out. A double invitation in this culture was very common. That's how you invited people. It sent a, I sent a message to Amy. I said, Amy, I'm going to have a party. Get ready. And then when the red party was ready, I sent my messenger and I said, Amy, the party's ready. Come on. And Amy's like, party time, because that's what Amy says. <laughs> that's how it worked. So these people already knew what was to come. And yet in this moment, they start making excuses. And really, the excuses don't hold up. They're pretty lame. I got to go inspect my field. Who buys a field without looking at it first? I got to go check out my oxen. You didn't buy them without checking them out first. I got, I got married. All right, look, we can use marriage as all kinds of excuses, but not here. It didn't get you out of, it got you out of military service for a year back then, but it didn't get you out of dinner party invitations. And these people, what you have to understand is all of them had already said yes. They'd gotten the initial invitation. They said, yes, we're in. Sounds great. Count me in. And then when it comes down to it, they now say no. Why? Because something more important came up. And don't miss this. What Jesus is saying here is that those whom God called, the Jewish people, those who had the original invite to the kingdom work, the thing they were waiting for, that when it arrived, some of them had more important things to do. Not all, but some. Certainly some of the religious elites. But notice what doesn't happen, and I think this is so significant, is that when people start declining the invitations, the master doesn't go, well... Party canceled. That's what we'd do, right? Not this master. Not Jesus and his party. Because that's what he's talking about. What does he do? He expands the invitation list. You don't want to come to my party? That's fine. I'll find people that want to be here. And the list gets expanded. The party wasn't postponed. He invites the new people. The invitation is widening. And remember... We talked about Jesus and those he said couldn't repay you. Go get them. Those that normally wouldn't be invited to this kind of a party, get them. And instead of creating barriers to keep people out or instead of circling the wagons and saying, well, let's just bring our people tighter, Jesus is saying, nope, we're breaking down the walls. We're taking down the barriers. We're extending the invitation so more and more and more people will have an opportunity to come in. And then did you catch what happened? That even when they invited more and more and more, what happened to the party? It says there was still room. This is a big party. 
This is a big place. And the master still, undeterred, says, we're going to expand the list even more. Go even further. Go even further out and compel them to come in. And I find compel to be a very interesting word because I kind of think, what compels people? What would compel people to want to be a part of the great dinner party of Jesus? Well, when I look around today, what I see is it's more that us versus them mentality. It's create enemies of the other people and therefore, hey, come be like us. Or it's these grabs for power or promises of positions of power. What is it about Jesus that for many today has become so uncompelling? Jesus says compel, and I think the way many people look at Jesus today, they go, "Mm -mm, I'm not interested. Is it because we look a lot less like Jesus today and a lot more like those Jesus was speaking to at this party? And maybe not us at Ashworth necessarily, but certainly the church in America today. And I want you to know this isn't just a, a parable about Jesus and the banquet to come, even though that's significant and a part of it. Because when Jesus is talking about this banquet, this party, he's talking about his kingdom. And when he's talking about this, he's talking about a kingdom, yes, that is to come, but that is a kingdom that is also today. The kingdom is now and not yet. And it has those implications. It's it's a modeling of a kingdom now. And it's important to point out that I think some could look at what Jesus is saying, the banquet that he's inviting people to, And you see the blind and the lame and the crippled. And you go, yeah, those just aren't my people. I'm not real interested in that party. And Jesus is saying, guess what, though? This is what my kingdom looks like. This is what my kingdom looks like. It's going to look a lot less like a country club and more like a place where everybody's invited and everybody's included. Not just the pretty people, not just the got it all together people, not just the people that look like you. That's what Jesus' kingdom is like. And whatever Jesus means here, he does make this statement. There are those who are invited but don't attend. And it isn't because their invitation was rescinded or because Jesus excluded them, but because they excluded themselves. Well, that's what Jesus said at his dinner party. What did you talk about at your last dinner party? Sports and weather? Got a little ways to go to catch up to Jesus, don't we? Jesus crammed a whole bunch into this one dinner. But let's look at the big picture. Look at this next slide. Here's the big topics that Jesus talked about. Compassion over creed, humility, generosity, priorities, invitation, inclusion. So here's my closing statement here. Let's listen to the Holy Spirit now to see what of this message might God may be, may be speaking to you today. Maybe it's the realization God's inviting you to the banquet to follow him. Maybe you've never felt that invitation And there isn't some magical ritual you need to perform if you sense this. It's just saying yes to following Jesus and learning more about him and living the way Jesus did and finding a community to help you in the journey. Or maybe as you've heard these stories, you realize you lack in one of those areas, a little less humble than we need to be, a little more pride than we want to admit, a little less compassion or generosity, a little more exclusive in our attitude and who can and shouldn't be a part of the kingdom. Maybe it's just a reminder that we need to look around the table and see who's not here, who's not at the table. Is the Holy Spirit saying, let's go out and invite that person, those people, and to start extending those invitations to those who can't repay but desire community and connection? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, speak to us now in this place. As Jesus just let forth a ton of teaching and a ton of just incredible ideas at this dinner party this evening, God. It's so challenging for us. But God, let us be honest and be willing to look inside to see what might Jesus be saying to us today. Had we been sitting at that dinner party years ago, what if his message of so much that he said would have just fallen on our hearts and just been conviction to us to know we needed to move. Spirit, help us to be better, to live better. 
but more importantly, to help us to experience you more and help us to learn how to model even now how to live in your kingdom. 